Good morning and welcome to this time of worship. I'm so glad that you've chosen to join us. Here at the beginning of our service, I invite you to comment below and let us know that you're here or if there's anyone that's watching with you in your household. That just gives us an idea of who's joining us and also lets those who are watching alongside you know that you're here. You're also welcome to comment throughout this video, throughout this service as we worship together. I want you to hear these words from Psalm 80 this morning. The psalmist writes, Remember how you brought a young vine from Egypt, cleared out the brambles and the briars, and planted your very own vineyard. You prepared the good earth, you planted her roots deep. The vineyard filled the land, your vine soared high and shaded the mountains, even dwarfing the giant cedars. Your vine ranged west to the sea, east to the river. The writer of this psalm is comparing the people of God, the people of Israel, to a young vine that God had planted deep into the ground. The brush of their lives, it talks about them being in Egypt and how God had cleared the brush of their lives and had prepared a place where they could grow and put down deep roots. And so as we prepare our hearts for worship this morning, what is the brush in your life that you need God to clear? What is getting in the way and choking out your joy? What is distracting you from what is truly valuable and, and worthwhile? Perhaps it's a habit or an attitude, a fear, or even a relationship. Uh, when we come to worship, we can expect that God can help us clear the brush of our lives. Secondly, how might God be preparing a place where you can grow and put down deep roots this morning? God's desire is not that we would have some surface relationship with Him or some surface Christian experience, but that we would be deeply rooted in the truth. How are you being called to lean into what the Spirit is saying to you in this season of life, this year, this month, this journey in your family, whatever experiences you are going through currently? The thing about being rooted deep is that when we're rooted deep, the storms of life cannot uproot us. The droughts of life will not cause us to wither. God wants us to be rooted deep, and so this morning as we open God's Word and let Him speak to us, and as we pray and as we give, we are making space for God to help us reach deeper into the ground that He has prepared for us. I invite you to join me this morning in prayer as we bring our praises and thank God for the many things and many ways in which He is working in our world and in our lives. We also bring our various needs before Him this morning. This morning we pray for those who are hurting and suffering, the sick, the grieving, and the oppressed. And I continue to bring these people before you because... Oftentimes, those who are sick or grieving or hurting or suffering are the people that we push to the margins, that push off to the side. Sometimes it's not comfortable for us to look at people who are in pain, but as followers of Christ and as people who worship Jesus Christ, we recognize that Jesus is always found where, those, where there are those who are suffering and hurting. We continue to pray for those who have made sacrifices in these days and throughout this year, whether they be teachers who are recording extra lessons, doctors who are working extra hours, or first responders. Would you pray with this, me this morning, and would you lift any other need that you are aware of this morning to the Lord? Father, we thank you that we can come to you in prayer, and that each and every time we pray, there's not a single time in which you are not paying attention to us, that you are not listening to our prayers, and so we thank you for your attentiveness to your people. Lord, we know that before we even set aside time to worship you, that you were already at work in our lives, that you were already wanting to say something to us, Lord. And so help us to learn from the psalmist this morning about you, about how you plant us deep, how you clear the brush of our lives, how you prepare the soil of our lives. And so, Lord, that's our desire this morning, is that you would do your work in each of our lives, that you would do your work in our church and would help us to grow deeper and deeper in relationship with you. We praise you for the good reports we've heard of people who are recovering from sickness, finding hope, finding the means that they need to continue to uh, survive in these days. But we also bring various needs to you this morning, Lord. We bring those who are hurting and suffering. We bring those who are grieving in these days, who are sick and, and suffering from cancer and COVID-19 and any other disease or illness that is 
that is tearing apart their lives, Lord. We pray that you would play the role of healer in their lives, that you would be the great physician, that they would know your presence. We pray for those who are grieving, that you would wrap your loving arms around them, that you would bring your people, your church alongside them to continue to help them walk the road ahead. We pray for the oppressed, Lord, who, though they might try to get up, continue to be beat down. And so, Lord, we pray that we would be on the side of justice and helping to lift people up rather than pushing them down. Lord, we pray for those that, who are continuing to make sacrifices in these days, who are expending their energy and who may be tired today, whether they be teachers who are already tired just months into the school year, doctors who have been working too long of hours, and first responders. Lord, we just lift them up to you and we pray that you would give them strength and courage, that they would feel appreciated. And Lord, we just pray that as the seasons and as the trials continue to go on, that we would uh, continue to support these folks, that you would continue to give them what they need each and every day to do their jobs well. Lord, as we open your word, please speak to us. We know that there's something that you want to say to us. Please help us to understand, to focus in, to clear the distractions from our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to thank you again for your faithful giving of your tithes and offerings, whether you're giving through the mail or dropping them off at the church or giving online. Thank you, thank you, thank you. God continues to provide the resources we need for ministry here at Trinity Church through your obedience. We recognize that in one way or another, God provides every single thing that we have, right? But we also recognize that when we are obedient, that we play a role in what God is doing here. And so we appreciate your faithfulness in these days. If you have not already, there is still time to share your feedback on discipleship. And that means anything and everything that we do here at Trinity Church that could be called discipleship, whether it's Sunday school or Bible studies or Sunday night church or Wednesday night ministries. Uh, we have a survey that we would love for you to take. And you can still take that survey and give us some of your input by visiting atumwatrinity.org. Hopefully by now you've been to our church website. We revamped it earlier this year, and we just hope that you'll visit that. There's a Take Survey button in the top right-hand corner. You don't need to scroll anywhere. You don't need to look for anything. It's right there in the top right-hand corner. If you click that, you can take the survey. It should only take you about three to four minutes to complete, and you will be doing us a huge favor. This week, we are excited to have Wednesday Night Ministry. Uh, we started with the teams this last week, and then we had a great time together. We're going to continue that, but we're also adding children this Wednesday night. That will be at 6.30 p.m. The children will be in the sanctuary where I am standing right now with Gina Mowry. The teens will be in the back of our building in the fellowship hall. We will be socially distanced. We are recommending and, re and pretty much requiring masks for everyone who is coming. We will be taking temperatures out the door. We will be uh, stationing hand sanitizer throughout the building. We're going to do our best to keep everyone safe as we regather together, but I'm really excited to see each and every child and teen this Wednesday night. Just a reminder, we will not be serving a Wednesday night meal this Wednesday evening. We won't be running the church band. That's uh, something that's a little different. We're not doing those things because we're getting rid of those things permanently, but we're doing it because we're trying to figure out the safest way to do this, to do Wednesday night ministries in the present. Um, kids and teens are encouraged to eat before they come and to arrange a ride with a family member or a friend. Um, if needed, please let me know if you have any questions, and we hope to see you on Wednesday night. You're also adults. You're also invited to join us for Zoom Discipleship. Brian White is helping lead that. He's doing a great job. Um, you can go to tumorstrandy.org. There's still a link there. You can join at 6.30 p.m. and take part in a great Bible study over the Gospel of John. A lot of great things happening. I hope that you will find a way to connect, invite somebody, uh, reach out to a kid or to a teenager that you know. Uh, we would love for them to be a part. This morning, I'm going to begin the sermon in a strange way for a pastor to begin a sermon. I want to be completely honest with you this morning, and sometimes that's dangerous when you're completely honest with people, but I'm going to tell you about my first run-in with the law. It was my sophomore year at Mid-American Nazarene University where I did my undergraduate work, and I had been hired as a resident assistant. And so a resident assistant um, had some simple role that they played. They were to build relationships uh, for me, I was building relationships with incoming freshman students. 
I was supposed to mentor and guide them as they adjusted to college life. I was supposed to enforce the rules of the university. I was the, the guy that was looking out for trouble on the hall. And as I became a resident assistant for the first time in my college career, I quickly learned that it was not a 9 to 5 job. Most of my residents weren't even conscious at 9 o'clock a.m. in the morning. Plus, by the time I finished classes and went to work and attended to my duties as an intern at a local church and finished my homework, I didn't even make it back to the dorm before about 11 o'clock p.m. at night or midnight some nights. But the good thing for me was I was still able to build these relationships and do what I needed to do because 11 o'clock p.m. to 2 o'clock a.m., when most of humanity is asleep, was prime time for dorm life. That's when the dorm came alive, this three-hour window in the middle of the night. And considering dinner was served five to six hours before that, that's when many a college student began the late-night search for food. Most of my freshmen didn't have any money to buy food. They were dependent upon others, the student had, who had just come back from a shift at the local pizza place, or whatever creative means of feeding themselves they could come up with, and they were creative. In one especially late night, as I made my way back to the dorm after working on my homework at the library, I was met by a pack of hungry, hungry freshmen who had what they believed to be a brilliant idea. They wanted me to drive them up the road about a half mile to the donut shop, where they would want to sneak around back and search the dumpster behind the donut shop for any donuts that had been thrown out earlier that day. I know, the mind of a college student. Gross. I thought this over for a few seconds, and I figured it wasn't the best idea, but it probably wouldn't hurt anything, and maybe we would have some fun while we were at it. And so uh, we went out, and we piled into my car, and we drove down the road, and we snuck around the building in the complete dark and began exploring the dumpsters for discarded treasure with our cell phones and our flashlights. And while we were searching these dumpsters, none of us noticed a car pull around the back of the building. That is, until a bright floodlight lit up the night and a voice boomed over a loudspeaker. We had been caught in the act with our hands reaching for donuts and dumpsters by an Olathe police officer. And not just one police officer came that night, but three, including the sergeant on duty that night. They lined us up and they took our IDs and they interrogated us. They asked us if the cafeteria at MNU was really that bad. And then they decided to let us go with a stern warning, thou shalt not dumpster die for donuts at 1 o'clock a.m. ever again. The law, right? I'm relieved that that's been my only run-in with the law. I know that maybe you've heard the word law and you immediately think of individuals in uniforms and judges in robes or courtrooms. Maybe you grew up in a strict household where you would say that your parents were the law. What I want you to do this morning is to set the ideas that you have about the law, whatever that looks like, whatever images it creates in your mind, I want you to set those aside. I'm asking you to just put them on the shelf until we're done today so that we can explore together. The law we are focused on exploring this morning is the law of God. Most people agree who study the Old Testament and the Bible agree that there are at least 611 laws in the Old Testament. But we're only going to focus on the first ten that God gave the people of Israel, known as the Ten Commandments. Maybe you're familiar with them. If not, this will be a good refresher for you. The reason that I ask you to set aside your ideas about the law, whatever images it, it elicits in your mind, is because when we hold on too tightly to our modern preconceived definitions of the law, whatever we think that is, when we bring those to the Ten Commandments, we may turn the law of God, a very different type of law, into something that it is not. Or worse, we may completely miss what the law of God really is, where it really comes from, where it's really leading us to. And so we need to be willing to set aside what we think we know so that we can receive what God has for us. And so our goal is to let Scripture speak for itself today, to define what the law of God is truly about from the words of Jesus and the apostles in the New Testament. We're going to be reading in a bit from Exodus 20, and so if you want to turn there and get prepared for our reading, 
um, I would invite you to do so. And we're nearing the end of our series, Exodus, brought out, drawn in. The Exodus story, as we've seen, isn't just about how God rescued the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt, as exciting as that story is. It is also, now where we are at, it is also about God drawing the people of God into relationship with him and transforming them into something new for the sake of the world around them. Last week we talked about the fact that God has a mission. He wants his people to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, to reach out, to be a blessing to the peoples around them. God has a mission, and his mission has a people, the people of Israel. So if you have your Bible with me this morning, I invite you to read with me from Exodus 20. We're going to start in verse 1, and then throughout this I'm going to skip over a few verses, not because they're not important, but so that we can focus in on the commandments themselves rather than the lengthier explanations that rest between them. And so I invite you to read with me from the written word of the Lord this morning. Exodus 20, verse 1, says this, And God spoke all of these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in earth above or on earth beneath, or in the waters below. Down in verse 7, You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Verse 12, Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land your Lord is, the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself. And we will listen, but do not have God speak to us, or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. God has come to test you, so that the fear of God will be with you, to keep you from sinning. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I once sat under a pastor who was a fan of the musician Bob Dylan. Maybe you've heard some of his music, but this has always stuck with me. Whenever he preached on passages like this, he would quote from Bob's, Bob Dylan's song entitled, Gotta Serve Somebody. Here's how the chorus of that song goes. Bob Dylan writes, You're going to have to serve somebody, yes. You're going to have to serve somebody. Well, it may be the devil, or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Bob Dylan's message is clear throughout the song. He talks about whether you're a rock and roll star or a businessman, a construction worker or a hairdresser. An accountant or a grocery store worker, we all got to serve somebody. And so maybe you're cringing if you're a teacher today, but the same is true for the Israelites as they journey through the wilderness. They no longer serve Pharaoh. They have been brought out of slavery. They are free, but they still have to serve somebody. And the question is, who are they going to serve? Will they serve themselves? Are they going to be their own bosses? Will they serve the one true God who had brought them out of slavery, or will they find some other gods in the land of Canaan, this other land, this new land? Will they pick another god up along the way and begin to worship them? So God gathers his people at the mount foot of Mount Sinai, this special place where God has a habit of showing up, and he calls Moses up to him to receive the Ten Commandments from his mouth. God lays it out for the people of Israel. You've got to serve somebody, and this is what it has to look like if you're going to serve me. This is how my people live. This is how my people worship me. This is how my people treat others. But as I said before, we can't rip these passages out of context. We can't just read these and say, well, let's just get to it. We need to make sure that we don't turn this law into something it was never intended to be. We need to make sure that we don't miss what the law of God really is, what these commandments are really here for. Why is God giving these to these people? 
A well-known preacher in the Church of the Nazarene, Dan Boone, puts it this way. He says, it's possible to know the commands and to even attempt to keep the commands without knowing the God who gives them. And so that's a terrible mistake that we can make. We can get so focused on the command that we can miss verse 2. I am the Lord your God. God himself is speaking. And so before we end our time together this morning, I want to share with you three statements about the, what the law of God captured in the Ten Commandments is not. Maybe these tendencies to turn the Ten Commandments into something that they were never intended to be. Then, I want to point you toward three statements that capture what the law of God really is. What are the Ten Commandments really leading us towards? How do we really respond to them? And along the way, like I said earlier, we're going to be looking forward to the New Testament, the words of Jesus and the Apostles, to help us so first, the law of God is not about control. I think in a way we've been trained to think about law or laws as controlling or restricting. Laws tell us what we can do or what we can't do. It tells us how fast we can go or how we can't go when we're driving. That's the essence of the law, to restrict our behavior. And following this logic, we might imagine the Ten Commandments as God's efforts to control or to restrict our lives, or the lives of the people of Israel here. The very words, thou shall not, cause us to imagine the commandments as negative things that we're supposed to avoid. But I think that these commands, once we recognize the context here, that they're given in the context of a special relationship with God, what God calls his covenant, his commitment to be faithful, to stick with his people, we can understand that these are not just about control or restriction for God, but about relationship. They are not given by an impersonal or a distant God, but by the same God who heard their cries in Egypt and came down to rescue them. The same God who desired to be present with them wherever they were going to go. God does not just lob the Ten Commandments from heaven to Moses. He comes down and he speaks them and reaffirms his desire that the people of Israel will be his treasured possession and he will serve and will serve him in a humble obedience. Excuse me. God has no interest in merely controlling your life. This is not, we do not serve a God who is just about commands, 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 laws. Don't do this, don't do this. God is interested in a relationship with you as he transforms your life, as you surrender to him and obey his commands. He gives his commands with the desire that you will receive them amid a growing relationship with Christ. And so, relationship is always preceding command. The commands do not make our relationship. They may form the contours of it. They may shape our relationship, but they come to us amid our relationship with Christ. Second, the law of God is not burdensome. 1 John 5, 3, the Apostle John says this, In fact, this is love for God, to keep His commands, and His commands are not burdensome. God does not free His people from the burdens of slaves in Egypt just to burden them with unrealistic commands that they cannot keep. Neither does God give these Ten Commandments to make the lives of the people of Israel more difficult. God is not setting up a test that he wants them to fail. He's not putting all these things on their shoulders that makes, them hard, makes it hard for them to live their lives. You might find the tax law of the United States burdensome, but the law of God is never supposed to be burdensome. Instead, God intends for his law to free people. And here to free the people of Israel from the traps of the world that will misdirect them and deceive them and destroy them. God knows that false gods will always lay claim to us and attempt to seduce us and pull us in, whether they're money or fame or sex or power or anything else in the world that we might turn into an idol. The things that we make into idols will always take us places that we never intend to go. So we need to make a transition from this idea that the law is this burdensome thing that's meant to weigh us down and it's meant to free us. In Psalm 119, 97, the writer expresses these feelings towards the law of God that are different from this idea of the law as a burden. Oh, how I love your law! 
I meditate on it all day long. These are not the words of someone who is straining, straining under the commands of God. Instead, they have learned that God's commands are intended to protect them, to give them life, and to keep them on the path to a land where they will shine as a light to the nations of the world. As we live in grace and obedience, we, like the people of Israel, will learn that God's commands are not burdensome, but freeing. They free us from the things that grab hold of us, and there's many, many things that try to grab hold of us and pull us down. They free us so that we might find a better way of life in God. We can leave things of no value behind and embrace the treasures of the kingdom of God. The commands of God, the law of God is not burdensome. And third, and finally, for this portion of our message, the law of God is not how we earn God's attention. God's grace and love for the people of Israel precedes their keeping of the law. Jesus' love and willingness to die for you on the cross precedes your obedience to the commands of God. In the New Testament, we read that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, not after we cleaned ourselves up and found a way to obey God's commands, Christ died for us and offered us salvation. The Ten Commandments here are not a path that we take to get to God. They're how we care for our relationship with God and with those around us. When we are obedient, when we listen to the words of God here, and we pattern our lives in this way, we are not earning something from God. Likewise, when we are disobedient, we do not lose God's loving presence in our lives. As has been said before, there is nothing you can do to make God love you more, and there is nothing that you can do to make God love you less. Despite Israel's repeated disobedience, and we'll see this throughout, God continues to give them commands and continues to clarify the ways in which he wants them to live. God remains faithfully present. He is the Lord who is compassionate and gracious slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. To be clear, there are consequences to disobeying God's commands. We will find that our disobedience damages our relationship with God, and it damages our relationships with those around us. It hurts others. We will find that we no longer have the same closeness to God that we once had. But this separation is not God caused. It's not as if God sees our disobedience and just runs away. It is self caused. When we are disobedient, God does not move away from us or give up on us. Instead, we move further and further from Him as we choose to follow our own way rather than God's way. The law of God is not how we earn God's attention or His blessing or His grace. God's attention and grace and forgiveness and blessing is freely given to us. So now let's make a transition. We've talked about what the law of God is not. The law of God is not about control. It is not burdensome. And it is not how we earn God's attention. And now we need to talk about what the law of God is. First, the law is how we know sin as sin. Before you question how I know this, Paul writes this in Romans 7.7. 7. He says, what shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. Paul is saying that the commands of God, the law of God, help us recognize the destructiveness of sin and the destructiveness of the idols that we are tempted to follow. If we are left to our own devices, we will each create our own understanding of what is right and wrong. This idea of universal human values that we would all just kind of sort it out. I think that this, the Ten Commandments challenge that. We would inevitably exercise our freedom in ways that hurt others. We wouldn't be able to separate what benefits me from what harms you. Just think about Black Friday and the videos that you've seen. And what we are driven to, this self-benefit, this selfishness. This is the same temptation that Adam and Eve faced in the garden when they chose to eat the fruit of the tree and thus define good and evil for themselves rather than allowing God to define good and evil for them. 
The Tenth Commandment, the law of God is the wisdom of God that teaches us to see our own actions and the ways of the world for what they are. Our world is destructive, it's violent, it's hateful, it's greedy, it's selfish. It all leads to death. The God who is love lays out what true love and justice and righteousness and life looks like. And he asks us to embrace his definition of good and evil. Thou shall not is, is describing for us what a good life, a true life, looks like. And so when we take the Ten Commandments and we say, what is sin? We don't just say it's breaking God's commandments. It is fundamentally a failure to love God and those around us. It is acting in ways that are relationally destructive, whether it's our relationship with God or our relationship with our neighbor, our spouse, our family member, our brother, our sister, our classmate. The law of God is how we know sin as sin. Second, the law of God is defined by love. Matthew 22, 34 through 40 says this, Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together, and one of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Paul says something similar in Romans 13, 10. He says, Love does no harm to neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. What Jesus is saying is what, and what Paul is saying is that we simply cannot understand the Ten Commandments, the law of God, without love being part of the equation. Whatever God commands, it's always going to come back to love. Having no other gods, refusing to make idols, never dragging the holy name of the Lord through the mud, and setting aside time to remember and worship God, are simply expressions of our love for God. It is about how we express our love, how we maintain our relationship with God. Likewise, honoring our mothers and our fathers, valuing the lives of others and not killing them, being faithful to our spouses, telling the truth about others, and refusing to be driven by greed and jealousy are expressions of our love for others. God is describing for us ways in which we can practically love our neighbor. And so when asked how he would summarize the law, Jesus says, and I'm paraphrasing, of course, love God, love others. That's what it's all about. The law is not about legalism. It's not about running around making sure that you or me are keeping in line and making sure we are crossing off every T. That's what the Pharisees did. It is about love. The law is not about rule keeping. It is about relationship building. And when we read God's commands throughout the Old Testament, whether it's these 10 or the other 611, or 602, excuse me, we should always ask, how is this encouraging me to love God and to love others more? That is the question. That is the key to the law, to the commands of God that Jesus gives us. Finally, the law of God is fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus is teaching the Sermon on the Mount. He says this in Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. When Jesus steps onto the scene, he doesn't do so to do away with the law, to tell his followers that the Ten Commandments are old news. He comes to show them how he fulfills the purpose for which God gave the law, for which God spoke to Moses here in Exodus 20 in the first place. To put it simply, everything the law says, Jesus is. In Jesus, the law comes to life. We get a clear picture of what it looks like to love God as he worships God and spends time alone with his Father in the wilderness praying. As he surrenders his entire life to the will of God, thy will be done, even unto death on the cross. Likewise, we get a clear picture of what it means to love others as Jesus embraces the poor and the sick and the disabled and the leprous. Jesus intervenes on the behalf of an adulterous woman and saves her from hasty judgment. He forgives those who are trapped in a life of sin and frees those possessed by demons. He washes his disciples' feet 
and gives his life for the world. You can't separate the Ten Commandments from Jesus. The Israelites didn't know who Jesus was at this point, but we do. And therefore, we have an obligation that when we read, you shall and you shall not, not to just hold them separate, but to say, how does Jesus fulfill all of this? How does Jesus show us the way? How is he the example and the standard? Because our call as Christians, as those who call us ourselves followers of Christ, is to follow him in loving God and loving others. Jesus showed that obedience to the law of God is a life of holiness and love. It is a life that drives us to show a watching world what true life really looks like. It is a life that preaches the gospel, the good news, that Jesus is Lord not just with our words and, and telling people things, but also with our actions. It is a life lived in close relationship with Christ and close relationship with our neighbor, with others. The law of God is not about control. It is not burdensome. It is not how we earn God's attention. The law of God is how we know sin is sin, and it is defined by love, and it is fulfilled perfectly by Jesus Christ. We all got to serve somebody. Let's make sure it's Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the very fulfillment of God's law given to the people of Israel, that each one of us, you and me, together serve. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we give you praise and we give you thanks for your law, Lord. We recognize that we carry with us many understandings of what the law is, and we have other types of law, but none is as good as your law. Your law comes out of a place of love, and it's a desire for a relationship with your people to protect us from the harm that false gods and idols and that we may do to ourselves. Your law helps us to follow a better way, the way of Jesus Christ, the way of love, and to turn our eyes towards him, to model our life after him. So Lord, we pray that as we read through these Ten Commandments, and as if we reread Exodus 20, that we would see it through a different lens. That we would recognize the ways in which you are calling us to love God, to love you more and more, to not allow anything to be in competition with you. And next week we will see how the people of Israel struggled, Lord, and let's Help us to learn from them. Help us to learn from their example. Help us to see how your law guides us and how to love others and how to love the person that we disagree with. How to love the person that posts something on Facebook that we disagree with or says something we disagree with or votes differently than we do in this upcoming election. Lord, give us a love for our neighbor that expands beyond the boundaries of our world. Give us a love that comes from you. Help us, Lord, not just to talk a good talk, but to live out the life that you intend for us to live and help us to do so by your grace and your grace alone. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Receive these words of benediction this morning. Go and let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another for, for love I'm sorry, for love is fulfilled, love fulfills the law. I'm sorry, let me read that again. Go and let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another, for love fulfills the law. And all the people said, Amen. Go in peace. Thanks for being here today.